Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. It's a well-known trope that there is a connection between music and mathematics. It's never quite made sure what exactly this connection is, but certainly scientists love music as a general rule. Albert Einstein very famously was a violinist and so forth. I think that it, there's more to it than just the idea that math involves numbers or counting, right? I mean, that's certainly part of it. You have a time signature, you have certain numbers of beats, certain numbers of notes per measure and so forth, but it goes more deep than that. I think that there is not just a mathematics of music, but there is a theory of music. I mean, this is not my idea, right? There's a whole field of study called music theory. Well, I guess my point is that scientists love theory. Even experimental scientists love the idea that there is something out there in the world that we can think about in a systematic way, talk about it, understand why it works the way it does. And music absolutely falls into that category. So today's episode, we're very happy to have Rick Beato on the show. Rick has become famous on YouTube, where you probably have seen him. Many of you have seen him. Uh, he started out as a musician, as a music professor. He's taught at places like the Berklee College of Music and as a music producer. But then he started making these videos on YouTube where he first started by explaining music theory, explaining chords and progressions and so forth to people on YouTube. And then he applied his knowledge of music theory and music production to explaining popular music, why certain songs work. My favorite subset in his YouTube videos is the series called What Makes This Song Great? And to me, like even though it's about music, this is quintessentially mindscapey material because it's taking something we all know about, we all experience music, and it's trying to understand it at a deeper level. It's not just this song is great. It's what makes this song great. And you dive into why this chord progression goes the way it does, why this change of tempo or this change of mode is effective in this particular place. And as we talk about on this episode, there's a connection between the psychology of music and the science of it, right? Certain things are very well known to cause certain emotional reactions. This chord change will make you sad. You know, this key is very upbeat. Why is that? And, and part of it is, you know, we don't know. But from the practitioner's point of view, it's just fascinating how we can take these different ingredients and put them together to cause an effect. And then, of course, Rick also has opinions and he shares knowledge about questions like, why is there a certain chord progression that seems to dominate all of popular music? And he has very interesting insights to the extent that it doesn't need to be that way. This is a choice that the music industry has made. So uh, he's a great explainer of things in a way that is perfectly suited to this audience. So I think that this is an episode that everyone is really going to like, even if it's a tiny bit of a departure from our usual fare. So let's go. Rick Beato, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. So I have to ask a semi-personal question to start here. Like if 10 years ago, someone had said, yep. oh, yeah, you're going to be a very successful YouTube star. <laughs> would you even have known what that meant? Would that, would that have been in your scope of possibilities? No. Uh, I, the only thing I used YouTube for was to send videos to my mom <laughs> So of my kids. That's pretty much what YouTube was that's what it was. The very first thing I used to YouTube for was looking at old music performances, right? Like people put all these right. things online. That was great. People you couldn't see live. Suddenly you could see on YouTube. But and, and my mom used to send me guitar videos oh, of people okay. that she would find online or music videos. Same thing. Right, right. So, uh, but that's pretty much what I used YouTube for. People complain about the internet in a lot of ways and social media and how it's denigrating society or, or dragging us down. But there's just so much good in it that it, I, I can't really get on the side of complaining. It's a balance, but but there's a lot of good going on. I agree. And so how did it happen? I mean, I think I know the answer to this story, but uh, how did you get into making YouTube videos about music? So I had this intern named Rhett Schull. Rhett is now a YouTuber himself. He's a guitar player. He was uh, had been interning with me since probably 2013 or so. 
And I started my channel in 2016, almost exactly six years ago. It was June 8th. I made my first video of 2016. Okay. And uh, in December of 2015, I did a video. Um, a friend of mine asked me to make a video of my son, a guy that a, a guy named um, Shane that I was producing, a country artist. And I, my son Dylan, I was saying, oh, Dylan's got perfect pitch. And I played these really complex chords. And Shane's like, oh, make a video of that so I can show my wife Angie. And I said, okay. And so I was – I put it on Facebook, on my personal Facebook, okay. yeah. sent, sent Shane a link. And I went off to my, um, I was on the school board at my kid's school, went off to my school board meeting and I came back and Shane says, uh, that video you put up, it's got 5,000 views. I said, what? <laughs> like on Facebook? 5,000. He says, I think it's a viral video. I said, no way. And the next day he calls me in the morning. He says, it's got 22,000 views. I said, it's unbelievable. And then by the next, by that night, it had a million and it was getting, you know, 10,000 views a minute wow. and stuff and got 20 something million, 23 million views, something like that. And, uh, but that was on Facebook and Facebook at that time was kind of like, uh, like TikTok is now, you know, you could have these really massive viral videos. And, and so we did a couple, couple videos like that. And six months later is when Rhett suggested me, he said, you should, you should be a YouTuber. And I was like, what? Nobody's going to watch a white haired guy with, on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, we want to make videos about make music theory, you know, history, whatever, film scoring, whatever. You, and, and that's what I started doing. So I, you know, I started with music theory and nothing to do with, with pro music production or rock music or pop music or anything that, that I'd been making my living at for the last 20 years. It yeah. was all, Stuff when I was a college professor in my twenties, I, I taught jazz studies. I have a master's and um, master's degree from New England Conservatory in jazz studies. I have an undergraduate degree in classical bass, so I have a pretty wide knowledge base from all different types of music, all different genres, and um, so that's kind of how I started. I just started with one video and just kept making them. Now I'm, I'm up to a thousand videos. And that a thousand videos, I cannot even imagine. I'm up to a little over 200 podcasts and it's just exhausting. So <laughs> kudos exactly. to you for <laughs> doing the video thing. Um, but, but the feature, the subject matter of that first video is kind of interesting, right? Why did it become viral? Is it just because people are fascinated by the idea of perfect pitch? Maybe you should remind us what perfect pitch is for those who are not music right. experts. Perfect pitch is to when the ability to identify any pitch without a reference tone. So my son Dylan can hear a 12 note chord and tell you not only what every note is so quickly, but he could tell you at the time when he was eight years old, he could say, oh, it's, you know, a, an E add nine over F major, you know, <laughs> specifically what the notes were, which would be, and the chord voicing might be, from the bottom up, C, F, A, B, E, F sharp, G sharp. Okay. So here's this E, B, F sharp, G sharp, and that's E add nine in inversion. And then F major is in inversion, C, F, A. And the, the fact that he could listen to it, he could pick it out, separate the two things and name them instantly is so beyond just regular perfect pitch, you know, because because yep. that involves music theory. So it's an eight-year-old kid that not only has perfect pitch, but he's got this He's got the music theory part of it. It has um, to help together. that he's uh, the offspring of a music producer slash professor. <laughs> That's well, yes. So when I knew, when I realized he had perfect pitch when he was about three and a half, I thought, oh, I'm I'm going to teach Dylan music theory because Dylan had ha had an incredibly good memory too. That um, I, I remember, I did a uh, I I did a th thing. I said to him, Dylan. Um, he wanted me wanted me to buy him these cup stacking things. This thing he did in his gym class, and, and I look and it's like forty bucks for these cups that have no bottoms in them, and you stack them as fast as you can and stuff. Okay. I was like, that's ridiculous. It's so expensive. And he's like, and he said, can I do something for it? And I said, okay. Um, and we had just watched this Vsauce video about oh, yeah. fifty two factorial, Good. and uh, the amount of possibilities of a deck of playing cards. And I go, um, I go, Alexa, what is 52 factorial? And it goes 80 and vigentillion, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it names this 87 digit number. And I said, if you can recite this, Dylan, I'll buy this for you. He goes, oh, no problem. Record it for me. So I say it again. I record it on my phone. He goes, just send it to me. He goes to his room for about 
two minutes and he comes back. He says, okay, I got it. <laughs> and I said, no way. And he recited it. But then I was like, wait, how do I check? I said, is that right? <laughs> and so matter. then I had to listen back. And then he said, I'm, I'm going to write it down. And he wrote it. I have a, had a, we had a whiteboard in the kitchen at the time. Then he wrote it down for me, the 87 digits. So, you know, sweat. And then I recorded him doing, I so wow. okay, well, make a video with me. But he also so. got lucky because, as I recall, you have a video explaining how adults who don't have perfect pitch cannot develop it. Just This is not going to happen. Right. It's an early onset skill. Well, this is my theory anyways. Yeah. My theory is that people develop it when they develop language. And I call it native music fluency because your native language is the one that you learn as a baby. Whatever okay. languages you learn as a baby, you retain. And, and, uh, and perfect pitch is the same thing. But people can learn – I mean, you do ear training and music training, so people can learn they can relative, learn relative pitch. Where, the where it's pretty much, if you're really good at it, like for having perfect pitch. Yeah, okay. And then so, – so I guess this is what I, – what I want to get into is just this intersection of music theory and popular music. And, and the big question – well, let me put it this way. When I was in junior high school, uh, you know, we had math, uh, sorry, music class, and we had a music mm -hmm. teacher, Mr. Bell. I still remember his name. And okay, unlike name. all the previous, yeah, exactly, all the previous, unlike the previous music teachers I had, he used pop music uh, to explain what he was talking about. And he explained to us that, you know, popular songs have a structure intro, verse, mm -hmm. chorus, and there's like the instrumental part and it, every has every group has a rhythm section and then, you know, the lead instruments and singers. And a, as a budding physicist at the time, like the idea there was a theory, even at that super simple level, there's a theory of the structure for a song totally changed the way that I thought about music. And it, I, is that a fair sort of model for what you're trying to spread more widely to the people out there on YouTube? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, uh, uh, I try to, I try to teach people things that, uh, of whatever the genre of music is, whether it's, um, the structure of a song, whether it's, um, <clears throat> if it's a, how to listen to a jazz tune, you know, how, how motifs are, are repeated and developed or, um, I just interviewed Bernard Purdy, who's a famous, uh, drummer that um played with with aretha franklin and steely dan and and he has a drum beat called the purdy shuffle that a lot of people uh jeff Picaro from toto used for rosanna it's a variation of the purdy shuffle or john bonham from led zeppelin used it for on fool in the rain mm. his own version mm. of it and i interviewed bernard in new york last week and he's uh, 79 years old and i asked him about how he mic'd his drums, how they taped his, how he taped mm. his drums to deaden the overtones. And then he pulled off his hi-hat. I started filming as soon as he came in there before we even had the camera set. I'm filming on my phone. He said, oh, this hi-hat, this is no good the way they make the, the clutch on the hi-hat. It's the thing that holds <laughs> the hi-hat to the, yeah. the top symbol. And, uh, and he says, um, they, these are too long now and they produce too many overtones. Oh. And, it's so fascinating to to talk to a guy that's uh, that was around when people were developing the sounds of how drums were recorded from the 60s to the 70s, how they went from three mic microphones to six microphones or seven microphones and from mono to stereo. And it's just it's all part of the history of music, the history of recording. So it's all these things I try to teach simultaneously and it's there's the historical part of it that's that's really important to preserve so i mean are you a believer that people can appreciate music perfectly well without knowing any theory at all but you appreciate it in a different yes. way if you do is that fair yes. absolutely yeah yeah music touches people in different ways i don't ever think about the theory of a song that i like uh, never even occurs to me i only think of it if i have to explain it to right. someone Right. Okay. So you yeah, yourself just don't my, really. Me myself, I made a video on the uh, this song, um, Josie by Steely Dan, this a couple months ago about the intro. I call it the weirdest intro of all time, or something <laughs> like that. And and um, and 
I started it and the video was very short. I just did the intro and I thought, well, I need to break down the whole song. And I thought to myself, I've never learned this song. I've been listening to it for 45 years. It's so odd. Hmm. Why have I never figured it out? Because, because I just enjoy listening to it. Yeah, good. And then did you discover reasons why it was good in the process of sort of taking it apart and, and thinking about it? I discovered that it was even weirder than <laughs> than uh, than I thought. I thought to myself, "How would you come up with something like that?" It's so there's a randomness to it that make that sounds so good. Right. The part sounds so good together. This was did not fit with any kind of theory. This is purely them experimenting with things that they thought sounded good together. Perfectly legitimate way of doing it. And I, I want to get into, and well, let, let me just ask it right now. Do you think that the most successful popular songwriters and musicians, uh, I mean, what percentage of them know any music theory at all versus being completely intuitive musicians? And, and which per, what percentage are like highly trained in that stuff? Um, I think that, that people know a lot more music theory, they might not know the names for them, but they know how things are put together. For example, does Elton John, well, Elton John, this is maybe a bad example. I, I did a breakdown of, um, of Tiny Dancer mm -hmm. last week and um, Elton John uses a lot of chord inversions. Now, does he know their chord inversions? Of course he does. Cause he, he's, he is doing them on purpose. Yeah. He'll play a G seven chord with a, with a, B in the bass and he moves it up to a D in the bass. And he, he obviously knows he's got the one hands playing the chord as G, B, D, F. And so he plays a B in the bass and D in the bass. He knows what notes are in the chord because he's playing it in his right hand. So he knows that these other notes are cool bass notes to use. They're inversions. So, but does he say, does he know that with the B in the bass, it's a first inversion? Maybe not. Maybe not. We Maybe he doesn't know yeah. what that's called. It doesn't matter. He, he knows that it sounds good. Right. That's the intuition part. And but he, but also the progressions are very sophisticated, Sean. Too, he's, yeah. he's he goes to all these different places using his intuition, but he has to know what the chords are to come up with them, put to put them together too. So, and, and that intuition kind of is trained by the fact that we grow up listening to music, right? It's not like if you were right. put on a desert island as a baby, you would figure all this out, but you sort of pick up things from the air, and even if you don't, like you say, know the names for them, certain things sound good, and you figure that out. Yes, a great thing that I know that I learned from watching the Beatles Get Back documentary was that the guys in the band have phenomenally good memories. Mm. For example, any time that they would go into a cover song, Paul McCartney would start one or John Lennon, they would play it and they would never make mistakes. <laughs> when John Lennon went to, to, and these are songs that they played back in the fifties and early sixties right. when they were in Hamburg, you know, they learned, they knew a thousand songs. Then when John Lennon would say, Oh, this needs an organ part. He'd go over and sit down at the Lowry organ they had. I think that's what they had in the video. And he didn't ask Paul McCartney, what are the chord changes? He sat down and just played the right chords and didn't make any mistakes ever. <laughs> now, if I'm narrating this as the video is going on, I'd be saying some things like, notice that John Lennon just sat down at this. They're writing the song. And he sits down at the keyboard. And he doesn't ask what the chords are or anything. He just sits and starts playing and never makes a mistake. <laughs> and the guys are just, they were geniuses. Yeah, it's not fair. I mean, they they were they were pretty good. The rest not of us fair. can't always keep up. But let me let right. me just do a very little bit of of asking about what music theory is, or you know what it what it sort of comes down to in modern Western music. Uh, we there's a lot okay. to cover. I will encourage everyone to go to your channel because you you cover it all. And you but the it takes a long time to get there. Um, so I guess you know octaves and scales are probably yep. the very first thing one should think about, right? And I've always had this really basic question. So, you know, we have an octave that makes sense to me at the mathy level, right? There's a note and there's another right. note with twice the frequency, but then we divide it up into 12 intervals or 11 intervals, I guess. Um, yep. And okay. So we can do that. I, and it's equally spaced and there's a logarithm in there. And so I, I even get that. Uh, but then we pick out some subset of those 11 notes and call it 
a scale, a major scale, a minor scale, a blues scale, or whatever. So who says, How? who decides that we should pick out those notes? Is that cultural? <laughs> is there some deep mathematical reason why we do that? Or is it just, yeah, it sounds good. Let's not ask too many questions. Uh, I, when equal temperament came, <clears throat> came uh, into common use, um, so that's equal temperament is equal basically. spaces between the notes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so during the Baroque era, um, you know, Bach has these two different cycles of alter temper cl- clavier, two books, book one and book two. The first book was, was written in 1722. The second book was w- written in 1742. So when he was, uh, 37 and 57 years old and they are, there's 24 preludes and 24 fugues in each. So they're in each key. And this is when you were able to play in every key and modulate anywhere and have the instruments not be out of tune as they would be in some of the earlier temperaments that they had. So who, who decided on this stuff? Um, as far as the names of what to call them, um, I mean, there were early music theorists that, um, that came up with some of these names, but some of the names of the modes were go back to (laughs) Pythagoras, I believe, you know? Uh, so, um, but I guess what I'm asking is, is less about the name than the specific subset of notes that make up the major scale, right? So there's some half steps mm-hmm. and some whole steps, and it sounds good when you play them together. You know, sometimes you're going up by a little bit, sometimes you're going up by a lot, and it sounds good. Is there a, an understanding of why that sounds good, or do we just, you know, say this is how this sounds? Let's put it to work. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, this is an interesting uh, question, an interesting topic. So, when I was, when my girls were 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 young, um, well, they're still pretty young. I was in a car and I said, "Let me play you something." And I played the the music to Psycho, the the slasher, the yeah. shower scene. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "What do you think? That sounds scary." Okay, they now they don't know what the movie is. They have no idea what this is why does that sound scary well it sounds scary because it is a cluster that's called an x cell so it's four chromatic notes they're not played consecutively chromatic they're in different octaves they're dispersed in different octaves but they give uh because of the way the overtone series works there's a lot of beating of intervals right because you have these all these close it may not be a half step. It may be a minor nine interval, which is a half step expanded. So mm-hmm. it could be like from C to C sharp up the octave. So that would be a minor nine as opposed to C right next to C sharp would be a minor second interval. And then maybe you have a B in there and that's a major seventh interval. So you have all these beating intervals that are beating really quickly and it gives a very tense sound and it just sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't know the, the, any theory or anything, but yeah, they know that it sounds scary to them. So what does that mean? I'm not sure what that means, but I think it means that certain combinations of notes together have um, inherent properties that will sound, will produce a certain emotional response from a human. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what I wanted to get into. It probably differs this. from culture to culture. It but, could, yeah. I, I bet that there's both some commonalities and some differences uh, from culture right. to culture. Because some of the reasons why there might be commonalities is there is math behind it. I promise there'd be no math or physics. But, you know, there is the idea that notes sound good if they're a ratio of a half or a third or four-fifths next to each other. Whereas if they're a ratio of 11 twelfths, you're going to get a little jumpy in some sense, right? So, right. so And maybe that helps explain why scales fit together in nice ways. And if you're, if you're teaching someone to improvise, you know, just stay in the scale, whatever you play will sound pretty good. Right. Yes. That's, that's, you're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct with that. Um, And when we're listening, okay. So, so this, and just tell the audience, I mean, what are the scales people should know about? Everyone says uh, there are major scales and minor scales. Is that enough? Or should the semi-sophisticated pop music listener be a little bit more knowledgeable? Well, the pro- th- those are pretty much the main scales uh, that that people should know. But there are certain scales, there are modes that, that are commonly used in pop music 
like the Mixolydian mode that most rock songs are based on. Um, Can you explain what a mode the, is? Mixolydian mode would be a major scale, but with a flatted seventh. So in, okay. in, in the, if you start on C, so C, D, E, F, G, A, B flat, C. Okay. As opposed to, to B natural C. So that's a Mixolydian scale. And a lot of rock chord progressions are based on the Mixolydian scale or melodies are. Um, and the Lydian scale is um, is another mode that's very common in rock music. Um, the verse part on Don't, on Don't Stand So Close to Me or um, Every Little Thing She Does is Magic by the Police mm-hmm. are both uh, examples of of um, of melodies that are Lydian melodies. So I guess um, I thought, maybe I'm t- totally wrong about this or maybe it's equivalent. I thought that a mode was the same set of notes but with a different starting point. Rather than starting at C major, you go up. But maybe if you just shift, it's equivalent. It is. Yeah. It is. It is. Yes. So so Lydian is the fourth mode of the major scale. So every every scale, there we I call them parent scales. Uh-huh. There's really a group of parent scales. There's the major scale, the minor scales within the major scale. It's the Aeolian mode is really the natural minor scale. Oh, but you have other types of minor scales. You have the melodic minor and the harmonic minor scale. Then you have the harmonic major and the double harmonic major scale. Those are pretty much the all the parent scales and all modes are derived from those, those five different parent scales. And if you're listening to a song, could you identify yep. what scale it is taking advantage of? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can pretty much just play <laughs> the uh, play the chord progression. You can just sing the scale that the melody is using and know uh, if you can sing the starting note of the bass of the co- root note of the chord and sing the scale, you know what the what the notes are uh, are, are suge- the, what what mode it comes from. And, and again, just to be like super naive about this, there's also what yep. key the song is in, which is a different question. Yeah. So the key refers to how many sharps or flats it has and whether it's major or minor. Uh, there are 12 major keys and 12 minor keys, and they have a key signature associated with them. And they go around this thing called the circle of fifths. So the circle of fifths would be, if you go in a sharp direction, is C, G, D, A, E, B, F sharp, or G flat. Then D flat, A flat, E flat, um, B flat, F, and then you're back to C. So that's a circle of fifths. And um, it starts with C has zero sharps or flats. The key of G has one sharp. D major has... G major has one sharp, D major has two sharps. If you go in the flat direction, F major has one flat, B flat major has two flats, E flat major has three flats. And this is just something that you commit to memory. Mm -hmm. These are the basic building blocks of music theory. I usually start with key centers. Then I teach people scales and how to build chords, how to build basic major minor chords. And, you know, same question for uh, keys as for scales. Can you listen to a song and know what key it's in? Or do you need perfect pitch to be able to do that? Well, Dylan can tell you what key it's in, but <laughs> I, I can tell you that it's in a major key or minor key or it's uh, or it's in a mode. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, unless I have a reference tone, I don't know the exact key it's in. Although if I'm hearing a guitar, I can pretty much tell you what key it's in if, I, if I'm listening to uh, to somebody play on guitar, I can tell you what the chords are and things like that. I can recognize the the shapes of them. And that's just mostly from super duper familiarity with playing and watching other yeah. people play the guitar. I, I call it a um, it's a, a collection of recognized sounds. Okay, right. It's a, it's it's a vocabulary of recognized sounds, pitch memory, tonal memory, whatever we want to call it. It's, it's, uh, you, you, you recognize that what a D major chord on guitar sounds like just by hearing it or an E minor chord or a major, they just have a certain sound to them. You can recognize the shapes and most people that are, that have played for a long time can instantly recognize those shapes. Okay. Okay. Good. I got it. And so that's all yeah. the music theory I wanted to cover, mostly to inspire people to go watch your videos and learn more details. So, uh, and they're not they're they're way more interesting than what I just described there. <laughs> well, so. well, you need to know what you need to know, right? Like you need to learn right. the scales, the keys, uh, the chords. Good, and the circle yes. of fifths. Very, very important. Yeah. But uh, what I want to get into then is the connection between these ideas and how the song makes us feel, how we react to it, right? Is there any sense? So if I if I have a key 
if a song is played in a key, like you'll often hear musicians say, you know, could we play it in a different key? Like my fingers don't go that way or whatever. Is the feeling of the song changed by going to a different key? Isn't it in some sense just increasing the pitch of every note by the same amount in some very vague understanding? That's a great question. Now, I would say yes, and I don't have perfect pitch, but I think that certain keys have certain sounds to them. People with perfect pitch really say that that's the case. (laughs) Um, Certain keys, A major is a very bright key, for example, or D major is a very bright key, and uh, D flat minor is a very kind of dark key. Or there's certain keys that that. If you try to transpose a song to a, a particular key, where to me it just sounds weird, I went to see um, a. Um, I won't say who the artist is. A very famous <laughs> okay. duo from the eighties, back about four years ago or so. I went to to the show and they were playing their hits. Now, like I said, I don't have perfect pitch, but they were playing them tuned down so far that they didn't even sound like the songs. I couldn't even. I didn't even know what songs they were, Sean. And they were these famous hits, but because of their voices, voices because they're older, they needed to tune them down and they just sounded so weird. Yeah. (laughs) I think Joni Mitchell sounded better in the 80s and 90s than in the 60s because she lost the ability to get up so high. So uh, sometimes that can work against you. But I mean, it's really interesting. The, The famous quote, of course, Nigel Tufnell in Spinal Tap saying that D minor is the saddest of all possible keys. And I, I still, I, I, I think maybe the connection with perfect pitch helps me understand a little bit because whether we know it or not, it's not just the relationships and frequency between the notes, but the note affects us somehow, right? And that's at the heart of these I, keys having it. I think that's true. I, yeah. I absolutely believe that's true. Yes, whether people know it or not, and everyone has a certain amount of this pitch memory, Sean. That that mm. is. Uh, uh, they have a, a a feeling that's a, whether they realize it or not a subconscious feeling of these things that that um, that affects them in in certain ways. I think. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then okay. So to again put it to use in some sense, um, if we if we know enough music theory, so we know some scales and some chords and so forth. There is there's a set of words I hear over and over again when you're giving your videos. You do this wonderful set of videos on what makes this song great. And often you will hear, well, because we go from this chord to this chord or we modulate from this key to this key, it gives us a sense of excitement or resolution or nervousness or fright or whatever. Um, how systematic is that? Like if, if I said, I would like something that makes us feel melancholy, does that translate in your mind into a certain chord change or, or is it just you fool around to see what makes that work? Both. Okay. <laughs> I, believe I think that. <laughs> you come up with this stuff by seeing what makes it work, but there are certain things, certain type melodies, like, there are certain minor keys like Aeolian, which is natural minor, that has a very melancholy sound to it. Mm. And the note in the natural minor, beyond the minor third of the of the chord, the flat six, which is one of the important notes of the scale that that gives the Aeolian mode or the natural minor scale its flavor, because it leads you down to the fifth as opposed to the Dorian mode, a Dorian melody that has a natural six and that leads you up to the flat seven. And when you have notes that are leading down to really strong anchor tones in the scale, the root or the fifth of the chord. So the, a flat second pulls you down to the root and, and a lot of metal uh, is uses a lot of flat two chords and things like that. It has a really strong um, pull back down to the tonic as a dark sound Whereas a sharp four leads you up to the fifth and a flat six leads you down to the fifth. So the sharp four is the li- from the Lydian scale has an uplifting, a celestial sound or otherworldly oh, sound. Okay. Whereas that flat six has a, has a more melancholy, depressing sound, I think. I think most people think this too. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Except um, let, let's choose that single example that you mentioned of the flat two, I guess, that is useful in heavy metal. Um, What is that? What's a flat second? Flat second would be in the key of C, it would be a D flat. So just a half step above the root. So it's not in the major scale, right? It's, it's, uh, 
it's a, a step below the, what would be the second note. If you go do re mi yeah. do re, it'd be. I'm such a terrible singer here. If I had my guitar, <laughs> I could play it for you, which I do have my sure. guitar. So there's your do. That's note C to D instead of that's a flat two. Got it. So it's just a single note. Dun, 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 dun. Has a certain darkness to it. Um, <laughs> that it makes me think of the Batman song from Lego Lego Batman. Not, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so so, um, so composers use these things to to you know evoke certain feelings uh composer you know film composers they know how to use these um these devices these intervals within scales that will give you these um will give the listener a certain sense of um like i said lydian is is a is um otherworldly or celestial thomas Mm -hmm. newman the composer great film composer he used that i was watching a a uh, talk that he was giving on YouTube. And, um, and he said, he talked about the difference between the sharp four and the flat two. Mm. And um, the sharp four is, it gives you a feel of hope, hopefulness, <laughs> things like that. I'm feeling very uh, manipulated was, just by these frequencies. Like you know, it, it, it's almost, is there a worry that it making it too mechanical to understand these things too well? I mean, I think the answer is no, but I can see why people would be concerned. No, but, and people just play the things and then they realize yeah. every time I use that, it gives it, it, it has a celestial sound or hopeful right. sound, you know, right. and it, this is just tools in their, in their um, repertoire that, that um, it's not there to manipulate the listener, but I guess it is actually, yeah. <laughs> I think all songwriters do that. Sure. Sure. Um, but but it also speaks to this idea that you don't need to be trained in music theory to have these feelings in some sense. I mean, you talked about no. the root note of the scale, right? That first note where you start. And is this connected to the concept that you raised in some of your videos about musical gravity? Like you want to yes. come back to that starting point. It's exactly what I'm talking about. Musical gravity, the, 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 um, uh, that certain, uh, keys, certain tones have a, a want to move Right. have a very strong pull to a certain pitch like in the that like I was saying that flat two wants to move down to the down to the root and, and it's commonly used that way yeah and it's interesting because it's not in the major scale so this is you know one thing I wanted to ask about was the major scale is so common because the notes all more or less sound pretty good together, but then you yep. get some interestingness by deviating from that, right? By, by taking something that right. is outside your expectation and, and that the sort of heaviness of metal uh, is one way to be interesting in that, in that context. Yeah. So when I, I interviewed Sting back in November and Sting, I asked him about the, about surprise in music. And he mm-hmm. says, he goes, that's funny that you use that term. He goes, if, if I'm not surprised within the first eight bars, I stop listening. <laughs> and the surprise, meaning going someplace that people aren't expecting, right? that that's really important. Having some odd note that you go to that's unpredictable. Oh, what is that? And Joni Mitchell's a great example of a person that just always goes to these places that are just, whoa, what? Wow, that's amazing. It's beautiful. Just <laughs> incredible, just I- I- intuitive ear that she had of of going to these different m- modulating to different keys that you would never expect, and these beautiful melodies that float on top of these incredible chord progressions that she comes up with with these alternate tunings, and she's so, such a genius. And then she comes up with the lyrics that work <laughs> yeah. with them, yeah. And and Sting is the same way. I mean, they just come up with these incredible lyrics that go with these you know all this things where you where it just goes to places you don't expect and that's what i i love about music i want to always be surprised well well while, while thinking about this podcast I, I came up with a theory for the meaning of life uh it's okay. to you know explore little bits of dissonance and surprise and and chromatic things off key but then always to resolve to the tonic that's my new theory of what we should be doing in our lives <laughs> there you go. 
No, that's true. That's uh, you know, you know, always bringing it back. You know, when you go outside somewhere, bringing it back to the to the to home base is yeah. really an important thing. Otherwise, things don't feel like they're complete. And of course, we can overdo it. So one of my favorite videos that you have is on the four chords that ruined pop music. Uh, yeah. what, what are these chords and, and how has their ruination taken place? Uh, the one, four, five, and six chords. How has it taken place? Because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of famous songs over the last 20 years that have been written with this exact same chord sequence or, or variations of the same sequence. Uh, you know, it can be four, one, six, five, four, one, five, six, one, four, five, six, one, five, four, six, <laughs> one, six, five, four, any yeah. of the permutations of those four chords is, is the, uh, uh, are the four chords that, that, uh, ruined pop music. And we've all seen these videos of like someone playing this chord progression and just singing different melodies over it and doing every song, right. That's in the top 20. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and you don't see it as much these days. It's not used as much. It was used in all different genres of music. It was in pop. It was in rock. It was in country, but really from the late nineties to, um, to 20, 2016, 2017, 2018, it was just used over and over and over. And, one of the reasons I think is that people that worked at record labels, they didn't think that songs sounded like singles if they didn't use that chord progression. Mm. So the people that were in charge thought, oh, whether they knew it or not, they would just always think that songs that had that chord progression sounded like hits. And those would be the singles. But what I loved about that video is that you <clears throat> did an experiment. You collected data. You said, you know, let's pick some of the most successful hit songwriters in our lifetimes, the Beatles and Max Martin, who actually, I'll confess, I did not know Max Martin's name. <laughs> but tell us who Max Martin is. He's Everyone knows who he is, even if they don't know his name. He's a Swedish um, composer, that uh, pop songwriter, producer that said, I'm not sure how many number one hits he's had now, probably in, in the high 20s or so, maybe 30. But he's not the artist. He gives these to other people. And so we, we all know Max Martin people, songs, yeah. but we don't know that they are Max Martin songs if we're not. In That's the, right. No. And and uh, and he has very few songs that use that chord progression as the Beatles did. I think that uh, the Beatles had only one song of their 27 number one songs, which was Let It Be, that had the one, four, five and six. And even Let It Be used other a few other chords beyond yeah. those. So it's um, not that you need to use those chords to make a hit. Clearly, if Beatles and right. Martin didn't do it. But so you're saying this is right. more commentary on the music industry than it is on music theory. Correct. Yes. And is this a lesson for young songwriters? Like, should they try to march to the beat of their own drummer, as it were, and <laughs> use a different chord progression? Yeah. And I think that people have moved on from that now, finally. I almost need to make a video about Yeah about that. Have we seen the end of one, four, five, six? And, and I, I haven't heard, you know, I'm not hearing it a lot. And maybe when I hear it again, I'll be, I'll think to myself, wow, it's nice to hear that again. <laughs> I, it, it reminds me that there's one music theory esque question that I had. So as a very naive music person, someone who loves it, but doesn't know a lot uh, to me, the first thing is actually a melody in a song. And <clears throat> But I, I, whenever you talk to musicians, they're always about the chord progression. And if I just knew the melody, could I figure out what the chord progression is? Or is that an extra thing that is added in the particular track? No, you cannot figure out the chord progression from the melody unless it's Bach or Beethoven or, yeah. or a classical. Depends what the melody is. But usually for pop songs, you can't tell what the chord progression is necessarily uh, because there's a lot of different possibilities. But, but there's a relationship, um, you know, you want to be singing songs that are either in or close to those chords or I don't know, I'm making yes, this up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the song. I mean, some songs, uh, some, some songs really describe the chord progression. It depends on the song, I guess. Some so songs really describe the chord progression in the melody very mm -hmm. clearly. Um, a song that doesn't do it, for example, is Smells Like Teen Spirit, which mm -hmm. has an incredibly sophisticated melody, but it doesn't necessarily spell out the chords. Uh, whereas, um, 
Well, I mean, a song like Norwegian Wood by the Beatles, John Lennon's song, is um, is in one scale. So it really spells out okay. the scale. Um, it's in the Mixolydian mode. Um, and it spells it out with the guitar part and with the vocal melody. Does, so, this, does um, this mean, in principle, that I could have the same melody over a different chord progression? Yes, absolutely. And people do that. Well, re, It's called reharmonization. You take a melody and you just put different chords under it. Oh, okay, good. I did not know that was allowed. So, uh, yes, that's really allowed. And, and jazz players do it all the time. They do lots of crazy things. I mean, I love it, but it is—is it, is, is it a, just a stereotype, or is it true that there's a slightly higher level of musical sophistication for a typical jazz song for, than for a rock song? Usually, yes, yes. There's, there's um, depends um, on what rock song, but a lot of most jazz songs have more sophisticated chord progressions and melodies than rock songs. Okay. I'm glad that we were able to uh, verify my prejudices along those lines. Um, yeah. You know, I wanted to get into, uh, it's interesting because this is, I presume that this is most of what you do now, making YouTube videos rather than, yep. uh, okay. Uh, so there are some videos that are going to be more popular than others. And I love the music theory explanations, but uh, there's a great demand out there for top 10 lists, you know, best guitar solos of all time and, and so forth. And yeah. So you do mix that in. Do you have like a an agenda when you do that? Are you trying to teach people along with just making a provocative list or is it just like, I think this is fun. Let's just go for it. I use those lists to expose people to things that they would never heard. I always put things that are <clears throat> out in left field <laughs> that would never be on a top 20 right. or top 10 list. I did a, <clears throat> I just did a video at the top 20 strangest guitar solos ever. And it was basically an excuse to expose people to, to weird guitar solos by yeah. players that they wouldn't normally hear. Like Alan Holdsworth was one of the people who's a really, he, Alan passed away in 2016, but it was a really sophisticated rock you know uh progressive rock guitarist and uh, instrumentalist and amazing virtu guitar virtuoso and had really weird song structures and very very advanced mm. chord progressions that he would improvise over and so it was my excuse to expose people to people like alan holdsworth mm. and the few of the people that i put in there that are out in left field i use the video to draw people in and then expose them to things that they wouldn't normally hear Good. I think that's a great. I have the same philosophy of a, my podcast. Try to mix in big names with people you've never heard of before. Um, right. But but the other you know genre of video that you come out with that I love that I've already mentioned are the what makes this song great videos. And one of the things I just got to ask while I have you here, you're often saying, "Oh, let's just play the drum track or the the backing <laughs> vocals." Like, where do you get these individual tracks? Is there technology that will isolate them, or do you just know people who know people? Uh, there are some technologies that I, that you can isolate some things if they are panned to the side or they're right in the center of the stereo image. There are pieces of software that will separate them, but I typically will get them if the artist is in the video. I get them from the artist. Okay. I mean, I had Brian May in my Bohemian Rhapsody video. People say, "Where'd you get the track The Bohemian Rhapsody?" Um, from Brian from May, Brian who's May. in the video. <laughs> I did. I had a video on Kiss from a Rose, and Seal is in the video. Where did you get the tracks from Kiss from a Rose? Um, from Seal. He's in the video. That's okay. You know. So, um, but pretty much all the ones that I play on that series are multi tracks that I've or stems, which are usually stereo versions of like the drums. There will be a guitar stem with a left and right, and and they're just things that people have given to me over the years. You do know that Brian May also has a PhD in astrophysics, right? I do, yes. Yes, just like me. So we have that in common. <laughs> He's better at playing the guitar than I am, but uh, <laughs> we have something in common. I love common. that about Brian. <laughs> yeah, he's done done uh, serious astrophysical research. It's pretty awesome. Um, so from doing these What Makes This Song Great videos, let me sort of re-ask the question that I, that I alluded to earlier. Uh, these are all songs you think are great. And one of the great things is about it is you're pretty ecumenical when it comes to genre. Like you'll do folk songs and heavy metal and progressive rock and whatever. Do you find yourself liking the songs even more or discovering things about them when you sort of analyze them at this slightly more conscious level than just grooving to them? So so here's – this is something I like to tell people. I don't say it that often, but when I say what makes the song great, I have a question mark in the title. Mm. 
And the, and the reason I have the question mark is that not every single song that I've analyzed, I think, is necessarily a great song. It's it's why I think other people think it's a great song. Okay. Even though in general, 99% of the songs I think are great songs or 95% of the songs I do are, are I think are, are great songs. But it's really more answering the question, why do people think that this is a great song? Why is this a hit song? That makes perfect sense. You know, when I read someone like Dan Brown, who wrote the Da Vinci Code, uh, yep. uh, you know, I don't think he's a great writer in the sense of what I look for in a writer, but he's got getting something right, right? He's appealing to some right. people, and that's a talent. That's a skill. He's doing something really, really well. <laughs> right. It's exactly right. And however, I, I do want to say I was just before we did this listening to the video that you did about Comfortably Numb. And I don't think you were faking the, your enthusiasm for that one. You seem to, you seem to be no. very genuine. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like I said, 95, 98% of the songs that I do are songs I really love. And since you're there, uh, I mean, you're, you have been a music producer and musician and music professor. Talk a little bit about the way a song gets made in, in pop music, especially let's say like now versus 20 years ago versus 40 years ago. Uh, I get the feeling it's not someone, an artist who is at home with a guitar, writes a song and then brings it in, teaches it to the band and they record it that day. Like it's a little bit, there's more moving parts these days. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. That used to be how it was done is that they would, when I started, that's what it would be. You'd show it to your band and you'd rehearse it, you come up with an arrangement. And then if you were had enough money, you could go in a recording studio. And if you had even more money, you'd go get hire a producer and you would record it. And um, nowadays, people can open up their laptop and, you know, get a DAW with a um, some type of a DAW interface, digital uh, analog to digital interface, and record all the parts, you know, with simulated amplifiers, simulated drum, you know, drum samples and uh, and keyboards and pretty much do everything in a laptop, plug the mic into the into the uh, DAW into your converter and do your vocals and you can pretty much do everything in computers. It seems like guitars or stringed instruments more generally would be harder to do in that way. Like if I just yeah. gave a computer a musical score, it could play the piano part or the drums, right? Yeah. A guitar is harder to, to, um, harder to do a digital version of, but um, you can get samples that are, you know, our pre-recorded sections and piece together a guitar part like that. And so is it, so, okay, so you can do that now. Uh, the computers are helping us do this. Yep. It would seem to me that there's sort of two directions that pulls us in. On the one hand, maybe it takes us away from the organic, uh, soulful side of people playing their instruments or even the sort of, um, virtuo virtuoso side of people playing their instruments really, really well, since anyone can do it and ask the computer to do it. On the other hand, it sounds like it's a democratizing influence where anyone can make an album, which I think is great. So I don't know, where do you come down there? Um, well, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it weren't for computers and DAWs, because the only way I was able to become a producer at 37 was that they, uh, DigiDesign invented Pro Tools mm -hmm. with the inter Digi001 interface, and I was able to purchase one for twelve hundred bucks and learn the software. I couldn't have gone as a thirty-seven-year-old to a studio and intern for two years to learn how to yeah. become a producer and how to engineer <laughs> things. I had taught myself, taught myself how to edit and digital audio workstations, and then that eventually led me to be able to learn how to edit video. And make videos because right. you edit videos just like you edit audio. And as a matter of fact, you use the waveforms, the audio waveforms, to know where you are. Just like editing a podcast, you look at the waveforms and and you know where to make cuts. So you do think that there is some positive effect of this, but pr but presumably there are some Absolutely. negative effects of too much technology creeping into the making of music, also. Yeah, uh, uh, people don't really have to be. Um, virtuosos on instruments anymore. You don't have to hire session players if you don't want to. Um, the fact that you can fix any performance and don't have to play anything in real time mm. makes it to where anyone can do it. But the 
the fact that anyone can do it kind of makes it maybe not as special. I don't know. That, that's 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 a debate to have. Yeah. Well, you give a couple examples in your videos um, with auto tune, which can fix mm-hmm. the pitch of singers, and then also with quantization of drum beats. And you know, I say that only reluctantly because quantization means something very different to physicists than it does to music producers. Uh, <laughs> but in both cases, you're sort of like rubbing off the rough edges, right? You're uh, yeah. making something a little bit perfect, which takes away some of the meaning of it or is that just us being grumpy old men you know is it is it uh good to be more perfect or is it uh making it too similar and clean and therefore not as exciting well it kind of depends on what it is you know people have been using drum machines since the 80s and some of my favorite songs have drum machines on them tears for fears and a lot of 80s music when drum machines first came out the songs that i really love used drum machines. Tom Petty used drum machines. On some of his big songs, he used drum machines. He also used real drummers. Um, and I'm not going to say that, that you know, no auto-tune, you know, uses, you know, there's nothing that's, nothing that's good about auto-tune. I saved many a performances <laughs> by having auto-tune on okay. records I produced where the vocal vocalist wasn't here or just couldn't hit a pitch and I would have a take that the tone of it was great, but the pitch might've been off on a line on a couple notes. And it was way easier to fix those and have the exciting performance and get it and have Mm -hmm. those notes be more in tune than using a worse performance that was more in tune. So it really comes down to to trade off. But in the, in the case of the drum beats, I mean, I think this is a very specific example of of the question that I have in mind. You know, we have in mind the idea that the perfect drummer will be just exactly on time, right? Like the same amount of interval between every two beats in the measure or whatever it is. And so what could be bad about fixing that? Because real drummers are not, you know, John Bonham was not exactly uh, marching to a metronome during most of those Led Zeppelin songs. No. So, so I find that the, 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 the human element of these great drummers. I just interviewed Bernard Purdy and he had a drum beat called the Purdy shuffle that, uh, they use in, um, what Steely Dan song home at last and sisters of Babylon. Bernard just has such an incredible groove and, and shuffles are based on triplets and it's almost impossible to do a great shuffle as program a great shuffle to where it feels really good because there's so many dynamics in it and the having that triplet feel when it's so rigid that it's got no variance it just sounds weird to me it sounds really <laughs> unnatural straight rock beats though are you know when yeah. they've been quantized okay. and things like that people don't notice them as much it's just like like a drum machine so yeah. You know, it's it's not always bad, but when people say I made a video about this song called Sucker by the Jonas Brothers, and there was a New York Times reviewer saying how how the this was such a great groove, and I was the contrarian on it, and I said, It's not really a groove, it's been quantized. <laughs> and I chopped up I chopped up the thing and I changed the tempo to show that it was all quantized onto the sixteenth note on a grid. Which is why I could change the tempo and change the timing of the song. I could make it faster or slower because it was perfectly edited to a grid. Mm. So there was really wasn't a groove. It was wasn't at least not a human groove. You right. know, there's a quote that I love from I think it's Francis Bacon who says, "There's no excellent beauty that has not some strangeness in the proportion." And I mean, I think I think this is what it's getting at, both from the dissonance stuff when we were talking about melody and harmony and and from the groove like it's if it's too clean and too crisp and too predictable it's not what we find yeah. really beautiful yeah i d- i do find though that people nowadays have been listening to quantized music so for so long for a generation that that anything that's not quantized they notice oh, they notice okay. that it's not quantized um uh and uh, and i and there's a lot of singers that when that mimic auto tune in their <laughs> regular singing. They mimic the weird, um, wh- whatever you would call. Yeah, I guess them. they'll distort um, it in computery. I know what you anomalies mean. Anomalies yeah. of right. auto tune that, that uh, 
the 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 weird the pitch bends that auto tune does, where you think, oh, "Wait, did you have auto tune in your voice?" No, that's that's me it's singing. They're just yeah. mimicking it. It's really amazing. Well, and Artifacts. all of these, yeah, all of these um, changes in how music is made. Uh, yep. Well, actually, let me let me. There's one follow up question there, which is. It sounds because I recently did an economics podcast. It sounds like a market opportunity, right? Like if everyone is doing drum machines and auto tune, then is there going to be sort of a a new place for more authentic acoustic, uh, slightly messy and imperfect musicians? Absolutely, and there is plenty of indie music that's out there that's not perfect, and and that a lot of people like, and and that um, I that I like to listen to. Um, but it's hard to make generalizations on, um, on genres of music or certain pieces. You know, there's things that are perfectly quantized that I love the sound of. Um, so, but it's kind of a, when every song is expected to be like this and, yeah. and it started in the early two thousands with rock music. I think that this is a thing that, that really, helped uh, limit the appeal of rock music was the tuning and the, and the quantizing of it that, um, that, that uh, made rock lose its edge. Well, this is going to be my very next question uh, following up on okay. the title of one of your music videos is rock music dead and why? <laughs> um, it's certain types of rock music are very much alive and um, progressive metal Music is very, very much alive. And I've made a lot of videos with a lot of the people that are the, kind of the leaders of the progressive metal movement, which is guys like um, Tosin Abasi from Animals as Leaders, Tim Henson, who's in Polyphia. Um, okay. Pliny is a guitarist from Australia, who's a fantastic guitarist. Aaron Marshall from Intervals. I've had these people on my channel many times. I talk about their... I talk about a lot of these progressive metal bands and, and um, that's a very vibrant movement. All the people know each other. They all support each other. And I, I just love it. I think it's incredibly innovative and I, um, and they're, they're just reinventing a lot of, you know, from the types of instruments, there's a lot of extended range instruments, seven strings, eight strings that are used, yeah. nine strings. And I find it really refreshing. So it's, so it's not dead it's just dead to the, there's no Van Halen's anymore. There's no rock bands that are massively big all over the world or not really, not many that aren't in their fifties. The top 20, uh, whatever list you have on Spotify or whatever is not going to be many recognizable rock and roll bands these days. Correct. And, but I mean, is that mostly technological? Because you also, also seem to suggest that it had, some of the effect came from wandering away from the blues based roots of this music and, and into something else. Yeah. I think that when rock lost the blues that people became disinterested in, in it when there were no blues based melodies in the last, uh, you started uh, seeing blues disappear from rock music in the early two thousands and new metal. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great new metal music, but the last people that used, that had a lot of blues based. I mean, and you had people like Jack White with white stripes that, okay, that yeah. use blue, but, but in general, the last movement of music that was a rock based that used a lot of blues inflections was grunge. And that's 30 years ago now. Uh, made me feel so old. bands like Soundgarden <laughs> and Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Alice in Chains. And they used a lot of blues based melodies and blues and blues inflections, a lot of pentatonic, um, riffs, things like that. So, um, once that, once we moved away from that in the new metal era, I think people started to become disconnected from the, and that happened with autotune happened in 2000, right? When new metal got really huge. So you had, you had quantizing, you had autotune and you had bluesless melodies. Well, I guess that's what, uh, I have no idea what the answer to this is. I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether or not there's a connection between these technological changes and a move away from the blues. So I'm, I'm willing to buy your hypothesis that moving away from the blues has let, has made rock music 
either less compelling or pop music less rocky or something like that. But is that because of the new technologies or is this just things that happen at the same time, coincidentally? I'm not sure. Yeah. It, it could be both. It's an interesting question, though. But they Why did they coincide? Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, that maybe there's a, a really different spirit question. to it. I'm just making things up now, speculating. But you know, the, when you say the blues, there's a very specific musicological I'm, meaning. I mean, to I mean, that. I mean, notes that are bent. I mean, notes that are not that are under the pitch. Uh, you know, things that are using microtones that. Right, uh, right. But all these are deviations from perfection, right? <laughs> correct. Yes. Yeah. And, and just the words, the so blues. Called, so called perfection. Sure, yeah. sure. But um, blue notes, right, in, in yeah. the broadest sense, sort of are the ones that don't fit into the scale you're playing. Um, but we yeah. also have this picture of like sitting in a garage or in a rundown saloon or at the crossroads and just plucking with your guitar and a, you know, a tiny little drum kit. And uh, it's very far removed from sitting in a computerized workstation and, and laying down some beats. So it, it sounds like there's both a musicological difference and also a stylistic, spiritual difference between the two approaches. Exactly. Totally, totally, uh, totally right on with that. And with that, what do you think is going to be what happens next? Are you able to predict the future of popular music? I know that <laughs> you do these wonderful things where like every so often you check in with the Spotify top 20 and go like, what is going on here? Like there's some, you, you say that, like the title is always like, I rant about the Spotify top 10, but you often like the songs actually. I do. And pe much to, to people's, to most people dismay, I like the songs. I just put out a video called Jimi Hendrix wouldn't be famous today. Oh, okay. Uh, just before I came, I put it out a couple hours ago and um, I haven't looked at any of the comments, but it's, it's uh, the video is doing really well right now, mm -hmm. which to me leads to, leads me to believe that people agree with, with this, that Jimi Hendrix, if he came out today, no one would pay attention. I'd be interesting to see the demographics on the views of that video. Is it just folks in their fifties and sixties like going, "Yes, those kids today don't understand <laughs> real music"? No, it probably is a really um, much like my channel. My biggest demographics is twenty-five to thirty-four in my channel. Oh, very interesting. And this is uh, so. This will be people commenting from that are probably all different from all different generations. Yeah, okay. Good, I, I will check that um, out. Yeah, the, so um, I don't know what they're saying, but it, from the looks of it, it looks like people are um, agreeing with my with my. Pre it wasn't my premise. It was um, it was from an interview. I I was I did an interview with a bass player named Jeff Berlin in 2017, and I was at the beach this weekend with my family. And for some reason, this video popped into my head. This thing that he said, and he said, "In the 70s, if you were a great player." you'd be, you'd be famous. And, and that's just not the case anymore. And I started thinking, yeah, the rise of the famous soloists was really a lot of it happened in the seventies, the seventies sure. the, um, and then the eighties. And then the, after that, the famous instrumental soloists, you know, even, even people in bands, the Eddie Van Halen's happened in the seventies, you know, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the bands that had virtuosos in them, are gone to a certain degree. Well, and yet the, some of the greatest virtuosos are here today, but they're just not. We don't know who they are. Popular. That's right. I mean, even right. the grunge bands that you mentioned, they were they were blues based, but they were not uh, characterized by amazing virtuosity. I mean, Dave Grohl turns out to be a wonderful musician, but that wasn't the point of no. Grunge. Dave Grohl is actually actually a virtuoso drummer that um, people didn't realize was a virtuoso. Yeah. I, well, I did, but. Uh, <laughs> And I don't mean that, you know, that, oh, I realized he was a great drummer. I could tell he was a phenomenal drummer. Um, the guys were virtuoso singers, as far as I'm concerned, including Kurt Cobain. But 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 sure. uh, Chris Cornell was a virtuoso. He's one of the greatest rock singers that ever lived. Yeah. Um, so the virtuosity went to the vocals in the in the grunge era. Fair enough. Well, you know, I always like yeah. to end up on um, a hopeful or optimistic note, or at least a useful note. Uh, I mean, obviously with you, it's too easy to say people should check out your videos, but I mean, maybe is there a sales pitch 
for the music lover on the street to become a bit more knowledgeable about what goes on in the songs, whether it's really music theory or just, you know, listening for chord changes that resolve in interesting ways? Uh, what, ha, why should we bother to put in that little bit of extra effort rather than just putting on random on our playlist and getting on with our day? I think it makes, you know, if you know a little bit more about music, it makes it more enjoyable. Uh, you can actually appreciate it on a different level if you understand how it's constructed. Just like you said about your your teacher that talked about the form of music, the yeah. intro, the verse, the pre-chorus, the chorus, the bridge, the solo, the interlude, whatever, and knowing those terms. And then you start listening to songs and you can talk to your friends about them. That's really what music theory is. Music theory is just the ability to talk to put terms to, to things, you know, and so you can talk about them while you're not listening to the music. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a very nice way of putting it because music is very universal. Everyone can enjoy it. But then to talk to other people about it, you need to be able to put words to what is causing or what is the, what is behind that particular yeah. sensation you got with that drum fill or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, drum fill. Or if you say, hey, Sean, do you, what do you think about the chorus on that song? Well, you know what the chorus is. It's the usually the title of the song. Right. Oh, I love that chorus. But if you say, what do you, what's a chorus? <laughs> you know, knowing what a chorus is 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 important in to in being able to talk about this. It's it's uh, if you want to talk about a song, you need to be able to talk about the different sections and know what they are. So that that's music theory, basically. Yeah, no, I like it. That's a, it's a great, it's a communication device. And you've done as much as anyone in, in recent years to help people understand that. So Rick Beato, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.